basketball. Hey, hoop heads. Wanted to take a minute to shout out our partners and friends at Dr. Dish Basketball. We've had their partnership manager and training specialist Jefferson Mason and marketing manager Nick Bartlett on the show in the past, and we couldn't be more excited about what they're doing for the game of basketball. Their Dr. Dish shooting machines are undoubtedly the most advanced and user-friendly machines on the market and truly accelerate skill development faster than ever. Beyond efficient reps, Dr. Dish provides training expertise and versatility designed to develop complete players. The new Dr. Dish CT machine has further revolutionized basketball training with over 150 plus on-demand individual and team workouts from some of the best coaches and trainers in the game. These workouts include video instruction and combine game-like shooting drills with ball handling, conditioning, and agility drills. Along with workouts, the Dr. Dish training management system also provides stat tracking and analytics to track progress and ensure accountability. These are just a few reasons why top programs like Duke, North Carolina, Louisville, Florida, Baylor, and countless others are upgrading to Dr. Dish. Learn more at drdishbasketball.com. Follow their incredible content at Dr. Dish B-Ball on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. And make sure you mention the Hoop Heads podcast to get $300 off your next Dr. Dish purchase. That's a great deal, Hoop Heads. Get out and get your Dr. Dish shooting machine today. Hello and welcome to the Hoop Heads podcast. It's Mike Cleansing here with my co-host Jason Sunkel. And tonight we are pleased to welcome back to the podcast for Four Quarters with Greg White, number four. Greg is from Bentonville West High School in Bentonville, Arkansas. Greg, welcome back. It's tip-off time with Coach Greg White. Hey, it's good to be back. Hope uh, hope everything's going well with you guys. Been keeping up a lot of great episodes. Uh, Coach is coming on, sharing a lot of knowledge. It's been a lot of fun to watch your podcast grow and proud to be a small part of it. Yeah, we've had a lot of fun. It's been uh, amazing just the journey that we've been able to go on and the, the people that we've been able to have on the show and the coaches that have been willing to come on and share. And hopefully we're finding – an audience out there that's getting some value out of what we're doing. And again, we're very, very thankful that you've been a part of it right from the very beginning. And so it's exciting every time you come on to be able to pick your brain and share some of the things that I know are very topical, especially for high school coaches out there, things that are on everybody's mind and you're getting ready for a big game tomorrow, uh, opening up your season. So we thank you for being a part of this tonight. And we're going to start out with, the first quarter and our first topic is scheduling and how that can be a challenge for high school coaches. So talk a little bit about scheduling and give us an insight from, uh, from your perspective. Yeah, I think there's uh, you know, there's obviously there's two ways you look at it. Um, do you schedule to get yourself better for later? Or are you scheduling, you know, to try to get some confidence and I've always made the comment on, on the high school level, unless my, income changes win or loss like I, I want every game to be a challenge and we try to do that we want to go out and find coaches and programs that are proven and have a chance and, and we don't really look at size of school when we say that we want to find um, someone that's going to make us better and it's going to be a challenge and you know we've all been whether whether you're the team on one either side of it where game gets lopsided and gets out of hand early and you know, I, I, when one side you need to coach on the blowout, you're thinking, man, I hope I don't get anybody hurt. <laughs> and, you know, on the coach on the other end of it, you just want it to be over. And that that's not very good for either one of them. you. Can say there, there's always a lesson to be learned for each team. But for us, like, uh, you know, we just kind of made the decision when we started this program that we'd play anyone, any, anytime, anywhere. And, you know, we, we've got a great, um, like you alluded to earlier, we're going to go – to Central Arkansas, to Little Rock Parkview tomorrow. Um, people that are familiar with Arkansas and Arkansas high school basketball, Little Rock Parkview is one of the pearl jobs. Um, you know, Coach Al Flanagan was there for years and so many Division One teams, 12 state championships, and he retired, and they replaced him with, a, you know, a guy named Scotty Thurman. 
um, who for Arkansas fans and college basketball fans hit the biggest shot, you know, in, in Arkansas basketball history. And so it's a big test for us, uh, from our staff, or our players, go on the road to an environment uh, that's going to be there tomorrow night. Plus, you know, with a coach with his caliber of his, of his caliber and, and it's, uh, they we're excited about it, but you know, on the other side of that, it could be one of those where we're going to play little sister to directional tech university, you know, and not really worrying about what the outcome is going to be. And I think you're, High school, I think you want to challenge your kids. You know, in college, I know it's a money's game, and yeah, you got to have wins and RPI. But for us, let's just go out and play and compete and make it as intense as we can. And if if every game is a big game, you don't have to worry about your kids being up or down. Like I told our guys yet this morning, we could be zero and ten and not be a bad team. That that's the type of non conference we've set ourselves up with. And so it's a it's a challenge, but um. It's. I think it's a fun challenge. It's a fun way to look at your off season or your non conference season. So, do you think that? Here's what I always come back to on this particular issue: is if I'm a coach, I have to have a lot of confidence in myself and a lot of confidence in my job security slash administration to schedule a game that's going to be a challenge every single night out versus. I'm a coach who maybe I'm new to the program. Maybe I'm somebody who has been told that, hey, you got to win some games. And so then maybe I go, I go out and I try to schedule wins. And from my perspective, I agree with you 100%. As both a coach and a player, what I would want to do is play the most challenging schedule I could so that, yeah, maybe my record is closer to 500, whereas if – I played an easier schedule. Maybe I could point to my glowing 20 and two record. But the reality is that what I would want to play for as both a player and as a coach is what am I going to be able to do in the postseason? And to me, what you just described, which is challenging yourself, challenging your team every night out, prepares you for that end of season state tournament, which to me should be the most important thing that you're trying to do for your team along with competing for a conference title, which I know we'll talk about a little bit later. No, you're exactly right. You know, last year we lost to the um, eventual state champions by five in the first round of the state tournament. And looking back, you know, outside of playing um, uh, St. Joe's out of Cleveland, you know, that was the only, that was the one game we had to draw from, um, experience on, uh, on playing a team with, you know, high division one talent, high coaching, um, you know, and, and I talked to Quaz about that later on in the year. It's like, I, you know, and he kind of was talking to me about, you've got to give yourself and your team more opportunities because when first, when the last week of February rolled around and, and we're having to go back to December to remember what it was like to play under pressure, to play against teams with really good guard play with high level talent, um, you know, it, we were, I, I felt we were unprepared. And, and that's a sad feeling as a coach to know that you didn't put your kids in a position, you know, to be prepared. And so, you know, we're going to open up with, uh, you know, obviously we talked Little Rock Parkview and then we go to Conway, Arkansas, and, and Jonesboro, Arkansas is on our non-conference. And, you know, obviously St. Joe's again at Christmas. And I, I added up at one time. Our non-conference is made up of teams with 41 combined state championships. And, you know, when you look at that number, it's staggering. But if you want to get to that place, I, th- I feel like you've got to play with those guys and have a chance to uh, to compete. You know, I mean, and like you said, you know, if we're 5-5 five and five at Christmas, I'm going to feel really good about ourselves. You know, a lot of people will be upset, you know, at 500. But when you're playing a, a schedule of that caliber, um, I think it's a it says a lot about number one your kids, but also a lot about what your program is doing and, and where it's headed. So we have here in Strongsville, where Jason and I live, we play our high school local team plays in a league that has some of the biggest biggest public school high schools in the Cleveland area. And I want to say I don't know if it was last year now as I'm as I'm thinking about this, it was either last year or two years ago that the team, the league has 10 teams 
And of that 10-team league, five of the 10 teams made it to the Sweet 16 of the Division I Ohio High School State Tournament. Wow. So you're talking about the fifth-place team in a league that made it to the Sweet 16. Now, to get to the Sweet 16 of the Ohio High School State Tournament, you have to win – Either well, there's four rounds before that, so you have to win or get a bye through four rounds of games in order to get to the Sweet 16. So it's not like you won one game and all of a sudden you're in the Sweet 16. Uh, so you know when you're in that type of league, your record may not be tremendous because you're playing against lots of other great teams. But yet this points out that you're prepared when it comes time to play against other high level teams because that's who you've been playing against all season long. And like I said, to me as a coach, as a player, as somebody who likes to have a challenge put in front of them, I don't think there's any doubt that that's the way that I would want to, that I would want to go. So how do you, what advice would you have for high school coaches out there who are maybe struggling to find games and trying to find teams that are challenging? What's worked for you in terms of being able to reach out to teams that are at or above your level to try to get them on your schedule? I think a lot of it's just, just the relationship with the coach. Um, you know, I, I'm a small school guy. I grew up in a class A school and we, we could not hardly ever find teams, you know, three, a four, a to play us. And because, you know, those coaches see it as nothing to gain and everything to lose. And we, uh, our first year at West, we played a team, uh, from the river Valley here in Arkansas. Um, at the class A school County line had a lot of rich tradition. Great coaches have come through there. And they were really, really good. And we, uh, you know, they had beat a team. We were in a, in a jam or a classic with them. And they had beaten a team that had just beat us. And, you know, it's there was pressure of, you know, we're a big school or a small school. And the, the fun thing about basketball is that that doesn't matter. If you can play, you can play. You know, the goal is the same size. You know, I had a conversation today at lunch about this. You rarely – Appalachian State beating Michigan at Michigan might will probably never happen again. Well, Appalachian State's really good right now, but it, one of the greatest days of my life, Greg. Yeah, one of the day, great, greatest days of my life. <laughs> but you know how how rare was that? And you and we see what you would consider a small school every March, and and so in basketball, it doesn't matter what your classification is. And so you see um, you see big schools that'll that won't schedule small schools. And I always say if the small school calls you, they're pretty good. You know, and right. they're wanting to play and. Being a small school guy, you know, I'm, I'm, in, when I first took over at West, this just tells you how my mentality has changed. I didn't want to play them, uh, even though I'm a small school guy. Well, now, right. you know, now I feel like I've been here enough and I, I, I guess established is the right word. You know, I would, I would play those guys now because it means a lot to their kids. And when you convince your kid, it doesn't matter what the jersey says. It's let's go out and fight and play. And that, that's what we've kind of tried to change our mentality to is, yeah, I mean, we've, we're not, in, in the public opinion, we're not on the same level as the teams we're playing. But the way you get on that level is you play them and, and beat them or play them and compete with them. And so I, I think coaches have got to reach out on relationship, you know, and we all know those. We all know the situations where there's a coach that fills the heat, like you said, and they're, and they're trying to schedule wins. Um, but what I've found out just watching some guys around here and guys in other states I know that, kind of backfires on them. You know, though I got a big school, Phillips some pressure. So he'll call a couple of local small schools and get them on a schedule. And then they lose to them. Well, now you've hurt yourself even more. Right. So Makes it even worse. Exactly. Yeah. So I mean, do you go out and schedule the Lakers and, you know, get beat 40 <laughs> and say, what do you, what, what do you expect? I'll play the Lakers or, you know, do you, do you try to find cheap? I don't want to say cheap wins because every win's good, but it, it's just a relationship thing. You've got to have that conversation with why you're willing to play. You know, and I tell everyone, I every coach I come in contact with next 10 games of non-conference, because our conference is really good, um, I, I tell them, you know, I, I'm excited to play your team. I hope we have a great game. You know, we respect you. That's why we're playing. Um, you know, like real quick, I'll recap on that one I was telling you about. We ended up beating that small school and never done this before in my life, probably never do it again. Um, I asked their coach if I could go in the locker room after the game. And I walked in their locker room and the kids all kind of looked at me like I was lost. And I, and I just told them my story, you know, Hey, I'm from a school your size. 
Um, I, and I told him, I said, I want you to know you got our best effort tonight. You know, we didn't look at you as a small school. We looked at you as if we were playing for a state championship and you got our best effort. And, you know, regardless of how many kids are in your class or on your campus, you guys can play the game. You play the right way. And it was an honor to play in. That went a long way for me, um, just being a small school guy. And, you know, I had, of course, the kids go home and tell their parents. And I had some parents reach out to me on social media and, and thank me for it. And I didn't do it to be, you know, for the thanks from parents or somebody. I wanted those kids to know, you know, how, how really much I respected them. And it, it was a fun thing. But I think it's scheduling has got to fit you and your program. Um, you know, we all know guys that go out and they'll be undefeated in the conference and first night of conference they get beat 30 you know and that, that's not what it's about it's about preparing your kids for for conference and for trying to make a run and so that, that's just kind of my take on all that couldn't agree more all right let's wrap up the first quarter the first quarter is in the books quarter number two Player rotations during games. Talk a little bit about how you set yours up. What are some things that coaches should think about as they're setting up their rotations? I think the first thing you've got to do is be honest um, with your players, with you and your staff. Um, you know, I, in November, December, the rotation seems to be quite a bit longer, you know, or larger. Um, and then as January rolls around, for whatever reason, it shrinks a little bit. And that's where you've got to have some honesty. And – you know, we, it's a tough decision to make. Um, I watched Arkansas play tonight, and Coach Musman used six guys. You know, and, and I have there's coaching friends I know that'll play nine. I know guys that play five, and and we'll call timeouts and do everything they can to not have to sub. You know, and that's just it all comes down to where you're at, what your philosophies are, um, and and how you're willing to to use those players. But, you know, the, the worst thing is when a player doesn't know why they're not playing or doesn't know what their role is. Um, and that comes through communication about, and, and just open lines of communication with the players. Our rotation fluctuates around, you know, eight or nine. Um, this year, I, I really don't know where we're going to be at based on different styles we're playing, different levels of competition. We may be we may be smaller than that, we may be more than that. And so I think a lot of it, if you ask most guys, what's your rotation? They're gonna say, I'm gonna find eight guys. And I, I think for them the struggle sometimes, I know it is for me, is what's who is what is that number eight? Is that a person or is that a need? Right. And and so that's that that's the hard part is number one explain to players why they went from playing in November, December to not playing in January. And two, kind of as a coach, just knowing what fits you. Um, you know, some guys have, I've tried it multiple ways. I've tried to have it scripted almost like a football coach where, okay, at the four minute mark, uh, Jason's going in regardless of what's going on, you know, and, and we don't even start on how things are going today. I think one of the worst things, I mean, I love huddle. I love crossover. But when you open up a report on huddle and it shows minutes and, you know, and the, and the kids can now see exactly how many minutes they're getting, that, I mean, that's, that's hard to justify and talk to about with other teams. And so it's, uh, it, it's a tricky subject, really. Um, again, I think it goes into style of play, level of play. But most importantly, it's got to be communication. I mean, there, that's what I think everything in our game is about, and, and and that's what it is for us. All right, so here's a question for you. Let's take your best one or two, your top two players. This is the thing that I always struggle with, and I struggle with it as, as a coach. And you know, most of the coaching that I've done either was on the high school level, I was a, a varsity assistant coach. So I never was the guy pulling the trigger on what the rotation was. I could make my suggestions, but never ultimately had, you know, the decision making stick. And then most of the other coaching I do is at a younger level where I'm trying to balance out playing time regardless of ability, where maybe the better players play a little bit more than the others, but not significantly more. But as a high school coach, I always think that my best one or two players should be able to play a 32 minute game at full capacity and basically 
almost never come off the floor. And I feel like if I was coaching a high school varsity team, that that's sort of the approach that I would take and then fill in the rotation amongst those other positions with other guys. And I think maybe, I don't know if that's easier to say than it is to do, but just what's your take on how many minutes you want your best one or two guys to, to play in a given game? Well, ideally for us, our best is going to play 31 minutes, you know, I mean, you know, out of a 32 minute game, um, we've never really gotten that. We, you know, we feel like our pace of play, we, they're going to need breaks. Foul trouble obviously is the killer for all that. But if we can keep, if we can keep our top two guys on the floor, 28 to 31 minutes, um, we, we feel pretty good about that. We have a, we had a young man started for us when we opened the program for two years. His name's Collier Blackburn. Uh, he's starting for division two Harding right now. And, you know, we felt like we rode him so much and he was around 29 minutes. And but then we looked at the rest we were getting, and, you know, stealing a 30 second, a 30 second break on the clock, but it was actually two minutes of real rest, you know, and things like that. And so I, I think that's a big thing is that we do this with our players. Take it. You take the game. There's 32 minutes. Okay. Well, that's 160 collective minutes, five spots on the floor for 32 minutes. And then try to do the math and divide that out. You know, how many, and we have our players do that at the end of the year. You know, if I got 15 guys on the roster, got 160 minutes, I'm going to give everybody 10 minutes and then I'll have 10 minutes to play with. And of course they're like, well, that's not right. We're not going to win. Then don't worry about what your coach is doing because your coach is trying to work this formula to win. Um, but it's a fun thing, like for coaches to even try to sit down and do. Just if you could play in the perfect game, like you said, take 160 minutes in high school and divide it out and see where you're at. And then it kind of shows you, you know, what you can do and what you can't do. Um, you know, it's the years you're limited with size. You know, you've got to get a little more creative about how deep you're going to go on your bench. Um, early on in November, I always like – always find it difficult because, you know, November is when they call everything that, that they're going to stress for the year. January, it goes away. Right. But, right. but November, you know, if, if hand checking is the point of emphasis, you better take 25 guys on a 15 man <laughs> roster because you're going to need them. But then January comes around and there's more, you know, you've got a better chance of filing a police report than you do getting a hand check call. And so I think the big thing is just knowing your kids knowing your situation and knowing, you know, what's going to fit your team the best. I, I have to say, Greg, I'm really liking my season this year. I only have seven kids on my rod, seven kids on my girls team. It's really easy to rotate kids in and get a lot of playing time for, for the players. Cause I don't have to worry about it. I have, absolutely. I can't remember. There was some, one of the big time great coaches talks about maybe John Wooden. Uh, made the comment, you got to have eight guys that can play and five guys that cheer their hearts out. You know, I mean, that's, and, and we talked about that on our bench uh, um, this week and, and later on too, is what, what makes up your bench and makes it the best. Do you want 15 guys that all think they should be on the floor at the same time? Or do you want, you know, your guys that can play and then your young guys at the end that are learning, you know, to work while they wait and, you know, just be in, just be happy to be on the on the roster. I mean, that's that's another that could be a totally other topic too. I mean, all right, well, just, I think I think that is our next topic. All right, I think that is our next topic. So let's wrap up quarter number two. That was the halftime buzzer. Let's take a quick break. As you've listened to the Hoopheads podcast, one common topic that continually comes up in our conversations is character. I'm fortunate to be associated with the Positive Coaching Alliance, a national nonprofit movement that provides valuable tools, training, and resources for coaches, athletes, parents, and administrators that is centered around sports and educational psychology and organizational behavior research. PCA combines this research with practical advice from a national advisory board of top pro and college athletes and coaches who utilize PCA principles at the highest levels of competition. Through a partnership with our local Cleveland chapter of the PCA, we are pleased to offer a discount code to allow you, our listeners, to take a PCA online course for just $20. 
to take advantage of this offer. Visit the store on positivecoach.org and enter the discount code HOOPHEADS20. That's HOOPHEADS20 with two capital H's. Coaches, I hope you'll take advantage of this great offer from the Positive Coaching Alliance and help us continue to grow the game. The Head Start Basketball Holiday Camp for boys and girls in grades 1 through 6 will be held on December 26th and 27th. Join us for two fun days of basketball fundamentals, contests, and small-sided games. You can find more information or get registered at headstartbasketball.com. Let's move on to quarter number three, which is player expectations and roles. How do you set that from the very beginning? I would think that that process begins to some degree with the tryout process and then continues as you get into gameplay and through your preseason practices. And then as you switch from conference to non-conference to conference games, just talk about how you set player expectations and how you explain to players what their roles are going to be. You're right. It does start with, with your tryout. And I think the toughest is for returning players. Um, especially when you know that they're not going to play a lot and they kind of haven't figured that out yet. And so that's a, that's a tough conversation to have with a guy that's going to return and for a junior and even tougher for a senior that, Hey, look, we want to keep, we want to keep you around. You're, you know, you've been here, you do things right, but you're not going to play a lot. I mean, that's a tough conversation to have and, but, but you got to have them because by having the tough conversations, you eliminate a lot of tough situations. And so player expectations, you know, we can talk about what you expect on the court, what you expect off the court, which I think is just as important, if not more for, for the reputation of your program. But everybody, um, I use this in our parent meeting. I use it with our players. You know, 92 Dream Team is, I don't even say arguably, it is the best collection of talent ever put together. And not ever, and every one of those guys didn't score double figures. So there's never been a team, including the greatest who could have, that all average double figures. Not everybody's name gets in the paper. And so the expectations are, you know, do what's going to help us win. That's what, that's what we all we ask you to do. And, We've had, we've had to talk to some young guys. We've had to talk to some older guys, you know, that feel like, okay, it's finally my turn. You know, offense is an equal opportunity. It's, you know, offense is based on who you get to shoot, who's put their time in. And we, we look at that things. We want guys to know when they get on the floor, if they're the fourth best shooter, that it's probably not a good idea for them to take a shot if someone else hasn't touched it. You know, and time and situation dictates sometimes, but. We want guys understanding who they're playing with, who is a better player than they are, and, and then vice versa. If they're the best player on the floor, they need to know that too. Um, that's not arrogant. It's it's knowing your situation, knowing who you're on the floor with, and and so the expectations, I think, start first of all. You can the player's going to have their own expectation, and hopefully, through some conversation, through drills, through practice that they start to see if their expectation aligns up with your evaluation of where they're going to be at. What percentage, let me ask you this, what percentage of kids in your experience, just ballpark it, would you say if you have a conversation with them, I don't know, either at the beginning, either right after the team is picked after tryouts or right before the first game, what percentage of kids have, if they're truly being honest with themselves, what percentage of kids have a realistic view of themselves in terms of where they fall in the hierarchy of your team? I think it's probably less than 40%, maybe 30. Okay. Um, you know, the hard part, things get tough with, you know, and not, not bashing on it, but with club basketball, because so many people can go get on a club team and average double figures or, you know, be the best player, and then they come back to high school, and when they don't have the same success, well, it must be the coach's fault. Right. And, you know, that that's why, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of against, I want my guys to go play on bigger bigger clubs. Like, I, I'm kind of against a small, local, let's just get a team together and play, because I think it does more damage for the kid, because 
worst thing to happen for you is the guy that's number nine on your roster in practice. You know, he's not getting the game maybe, but he is getting to scrimmage every day in a five on five situation. Well, he goes and plays somewhere in the summer and come and is their best player and comes back. And, you know, all of a sudden now in practice, he's not doing what he was doing because he's either trying to impress you with something or he just thinks he's better than he is now. And that's, that's the hard part on the reality is these guys like don't, if I get if pretty much, if I, if you give any trainer, any club coach enough money, they're going to tell you you're pretty good. <laughs> and, and I mean, that's not knocking on those guys. It's just no, how it's it is. True. Yeah, I mean, it's true. It's totally true. You know, and on a high school level, it doesn't work that way, hopefully, you know, and, and that's why I love clubs like Mocan and, that and that just you know it's not about okay well you're going to pay your way into the program you're going to you're going to pay your way in with your skill and your athleticism and then if you get minutes it's just even bonus and so that's the hard part too it's just guys coming back from the summer and their role changes um you know we we've talked to a couple of young men in the past about we this is what we need from you um this is where you're at and and one left and end up having a nice high school career somewhere else. And the other guy stayed and had a great career with us. But it's, again, I, I keep, you know, circling back to it, but it always comes back to the communication piece. Like you've got to have those talks to, um, because it cleans up so much of the, of the questions. And I, I don't know, it's just one of those things for me, like expectation and roles. Like when you say role player, people get so upset because they don't see it as a star. Well, being a star is a role. But the NBA is, I mean, how many shoe guys are there? Ten, yeah. maybe? Well, I'll give you a great example, Greg. We talked to Mike Procopio, who I know you know. Mm -hmm. And we talked to Mike, uh, when was that? I don't know, a couple of days ago. And he talked about how, in his work with NBA players, that he would talk to these guys and say, look, how many guys are there that get, 20 shots in a game whose role it is to score points. Maybe there's 30, maybe, maybe. And then, you know, and, and there's, he's, I think he's, I think the number he threw out there was there's a hundred guys that matter in the league. And then the other 250 guys are just pieces parts. And he's like, you have to, if you're one of those 250 guys and you want to have a career, you have to be very, very good at something. So figure out what that something is that your coach wants you to be good at and just execute that and figure out how to be good at that and be a role player at that. And he's like, these are the very, very best players in the entire world. They're one of the 350 best players in the world, and they don't get as many shots as they want. They don't get to handle the ball. They don't get to control the action. They have to fit themselves into a role. And so you think about what you do as a high school coach and the fact that you're having to sell a 15-year-old sophomore on being a role player on a varsity team. You know, it's just – it's interesting that no matter what level you are, you have to get guys to buy into playing their role in order to, A, help the team be successful, but, B, help them – to be successful as a player because no matter what you say, not everybody's going to be, not everybody gets to be the man. And really what determines your success as a team is what are those other guys around the man doing to make sure that the team can succeed? And that's what I hear you saying. Well, and that's the thing is, again, you've got to have honest conversation with players and, and, you know, some people think, Oh, well, you know, you're just trying to hurt their feelings. No, I'm trying to save their career. Um, good friend of mine, you know, as a trainer in the area and, and there was a family a couple of years ago that he just told him, look, I'm, I'm not going to work with you because this is the role you are. This is what you are. You know, they're, they're wanting to increase his scoring. And the kid wasn't a scorer. He was on a really nice high school team, started, did his job. He was the defender, you know, he rebounded, he had the put back baskets, but you know, in his family's eyes, and, and I think a little bit in his too, he wanted to be the guy, like you were talking about, handling the ball, stepping out, doing this. So he didn't, he refused to work with him. You know, took money out of his pocket. Well, another guy in town picked it up. Well, you know, and tells him, oh, you're going to be doing this. And he's got, he's got him doing the six step backs and everything. And 
you know, sadly, the kid was cut the following year at his high school because when he came in for tryouts, he, you know, he had gotten outside of who he was, what had made him successful, what had made that coach want to keep him. And I, I mean, you said it best. I mean, there, and, and I think it was Procopi who we talked about it one year at Snow Valley about shoe guys. You know, there's only, I, I don't even know everybody that has a shoe, in it, but I know it's not a lot. You know, I mean, you think the Kyrie's, LeBron's, KD's, those guys, well, we're, we, everybody wants to be those guys. And there's not even those, the guys in the league aren't even trying to be those guys. The guys right, in the exactly. Are just trying to hold on and say, you know, I can play defense, I can rebound, give me my spot. And, so the expectation and role, I mean, hopefully they see that and they understand it. But, you know, in a society that everybody wants to be number one, you know, it, they got to understand two, three, four, and five get to place too. And, that, and that's the thing that comes back on coaches. Yeah, no doubt. You talked a little bit about expectations off the floor. Can you address that a little bit about how you set expectations for your team and your players for how they conduct themselves off the court? Yeah, we, uh, you know, when I worked with Brad Stamps, who, who's been a guest on here, we talked about winning the classroom, winning the court, winning the community, and the court being the least important of those. And we just tell our guys, we tell our parents this, like, we're not going to, number one, do anything to embarrass you. So we ask that same in return um, with your actions, you know, in, in the hallway, that, that when you're walking around with a West High basketball hoodie on, you're not doing something that, is offensive to people either with your language or behavior. You know, we just tell them the simplest way to tell it is this. I just want to coach basketball. I don't want to police you. I don't want to police the locker room. I just want to teach you how to play the game of basketball. And we tell guys that we're not going to waste time having to answer emails to, for teachers because you don't act right. Answer administrators wondering why you're missing practice because you're in, you know, ISS or something crazy like that. And, you know, there's different situations I've been in in schools um, where it's, it's a little harder to do that, but basketball has got to mean so much to a young man or a young lady that, you know, they separate themselves from that. I mean, anybody can be a knucklehead in the hallway, but if you can separate yourself from those people and, you know, I mean, it doesn't mean you don't have to be friends with them, but it's, hey, I'm not going to do that. Hey, I'm not going to talk in class today because I don't want to, I don't want this coming back on our coaches. And, and we and we tell them when we hand them their jersey, that jersey, yes, it has our school name on it, but it also has my name on it and it has your family's name on it and it has anyone that's associated with us on it. So your actions on the court, you know, your actions, whether we're in a restaurant, anywhere we are, you know, when you're a representation of this basketball program, has to be, you know, exemplary and, and beyond, you know, where if if someone wants to say, oh, that kid plays at West, that the person they're telling that to says there's no way, you know, there, there's no way he plays at West and acts that way. And, and we feel like we've done that. I mean, we've had a couple of hiccups along the way, but we removed those pretty quick. And, uh, and, and I think our kids are appreciative of that. And I think the parents in our program are appreciative of that too. Yeah, I think you said it best by saying you want to coach basketball. You don't want to have to police kids all over wherever they are. And I think as you establish your culture and you establish those expectations, that sort of becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy because the guys start to police themselves and people just know, hey, if you want to be associated with Bentonville West basketball, then this is what the expectation is. And I think when you get there, that's when you really know that you've had success. All right, let's wrap up the third quarter. All right, listeners, it's time for the fourth quarter. Quarter number four, the non-conference versus conference mentality for you and your team. Um, you know, it kind of goes back to scheduling what we talked about in the first quarter. Um, for us, you know, it there's nothing in October – for colleges and, and November for high school that matters less than getting beat. Um, there's a couple of small schools in Arkansas and I'm sure other parts of the state or I mean of the country that they have a conference game early in December and January or in November before you get to January. For us, we're lucky enough in our classification, we don't have a conference game until January. So we look at November and December as yes, they're important and they matter, but they don't count. And you know, I mean, we may, like I said, we may go tomorrow and 
come out with a loss and that's not going to detour our season. Um, it's going to be something we learn from and work at. And that's one of the big things is that we really focus on the non-conference as a preparation. Um, and, you know, conferences, it, it's, it's so funny how conference makes things change. Your your mentality, how everything just kind of tightens up. I mean, the officiating changes, and, and I don't understand that, but, I mean, it's kind of a funny <laughs> thing, but it just happens. Like, when January rolls around for us, it's a lot more intense in practice. Uh, it's a lot more intense, you know, everywhere. And so that's uh, that's why we're trying to, to get our guys ready for, you know, this, these next 10 games over these next, you know, three weeks. Do you talk about in the in your non conference schedule during practices? Are you talking about opponents' games that you're going to see in the conference as part of your preparation for your non conference games? If a team is going to play maybe a similar style or do something that you anticipate you might see during the conference schedule, or are you focusing strictly on the non conference games and it's just sort of hanging there in the back of everyone's head or do you bring it out and actually talk about it? No, we talk about it, you know, and we, uh, we try to find as many common opponents as we can, you know, um, uh, uh, Brad, you know, stamps at Fayetteville, they're going to play Jonesboro. We're going to play Jonesboro. Well, the scary part of that is what if, you know, what if Brad and them were to blow that, which I think would be a really good game, but what if, what if Fayetteville blows out Jonesboro and then Jonesboro blows us out? Well, <laughs> our kids are smart enough to realize that you right. know, it's a different correlation. Games don't, um, you know, Evansville beat Kentucky earlier in the year. I don't, I don't think anybody's going to put Evansville winning their, their national championship bracket. But and basketball is just that it's a funny game. It's a round ball. You know, that ball does a lot of crazy things. That rim's really big up there. And, and so we we try to find ways to hopefully get some common opponents, but you know, like we stated earlier, we're talking about we want to we want to give our guys as many opportunities as we can to go up against things that when they see it in January, it's not the first time. When they see it in February, it's not the first time, and definitely when they see it in the, in the state tournament. And so we we always talk about, hey, this team is very similar to. Fayetteville or Bentonville or Rogers or whoever in our league. And in the past, we've had gotten lucky that we've actually played teams that run some of the similar things, uh, defense, you know, when we play, a, we play a team in exhibition that runs a matchup. Well, we have a team in our league runs a matchup. And so it's easy to, to get our, your guys mentality about, Hey, remember when we play these guys? Oh yeah. And so it helps our players. I think mentally, um, kind of helps us coaching wise, letting, letting us see the physicality of what it's going to be like in league. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's a big thing for us to make sure that we prepare our guys. From a scouting standpoint and from a film standpoint, how much time are you spending on a conference opponent versus a non-conference opponent? Is it similar? Are you spending more time? on the prep for a conference game simply because you have more to look back on, maybe film from previous years, or obviously if you played a team already that season, uh, just talk about the prep for you individually as a coach and then how much you share with your players to help them get prepared for a conference game. Um, that's a great question. I think for us, the the scouting report is more for me to feel better about things. <laughs> right. I don't show our players a lot of it. I kind of show our players um, – we do a walkthrough of their inbounds plays. We talk about the, here's a couple sets that are going to be difficult to defend. And so we show them how we would defend it. And, you know, we give scouting reports based off of uh, right hand, left hand, and what closeout we'll use. We have different closeout based off different players. Curry closeout being the, uh, you know, he's a good shooter. Go touch him. A Kobe means he can shoot and drive. So you got to play it straight up. A Rondo is a guy that wants to drive, not shoot. And then a Shaq is you can stay in the lane. And, uh, nice. And nice. so I love our, it. Love our it. guys understand that, but yep. like now my scouting report is almost three pages long, you know, cause I, I watch film, ask myself questions, write them down, just trying to find things that on my game sheet that I, I feel prepared. Um, 
the guys, you know, our guys just want to play. And so that's the hard part on that. We spend first game, you know, we're, we spend quite a bit of time getting prepared for that. But next week we'll play, we got everything saying we'll play Tuesday, we'll play Friday, Saturday. We'll try, um, you know, to have a little bit of film that we can get from other coaches on those. But there's years we've in the past where we've not scouted an off season or the non-conference. We just, Hey, let's just get out and play, be more worried about ourselves than we are about them. Um, but conference, we, uh, our league changes film or exchanges film, which is a big thing, a big thing for us. So by the time I play Bentonville this year, I'll have seven to nine films on them. And I'll go through every one of them. And, you know, the second time through now, it, it gets up to 14 minimum. And so non-conference, this year we're spending a little more time in it just because um, the investment we've made with Huddle Assist and kind of cleans up some things for us. But for us, these games are, are very tough. and We don't feel like we can just show up. You know, and that, that kind of goes with some of the scouting. Uh, in the past, we felt like, hey, we can just roll in. But then we realized when we took that mentality as a coach, our players took it. So we're trying to make our non-conference scout a little better and a little bit more as in-depth as our conference. But some of it's just so hard because you don't have film on people because they haven't played. And right, right. So that that's the thing for, for us is trying to make it as similar to conference, but also understanding that you know, it may be difficult to do that. So just as a general rule, what I'm going to go with the what percentage question again. What percentage of your kids want more of the scouting report, want to be able to watch film? Because obviously they can, I'm sure, log on to Huddle and get on and, and watch extra film, and you could probably track who's watching and who's not. So how many of your kids want more, and how many of those kids do you think their eyes are glazing over when you start going over the scouting report and are just like, Coach, I just want to play? I would say for <laughs> – I think it different. It's different for every team. Right, right. Uh, this team right now that we have coming in, you know, we've filmed practice, we've put it up, um, we've done we an exhibition game. It's on there, and it's funny you said that. I'm looking right now. We don't have. <laughs> we have three guys right now that have watched more than 15 minutes this week. Okay. You know, and so that's a. Uh, that kind of, and you know, that's the thing too. Like, I don't blame them for it. I feel like I need to do my job on there. Uh, the past year, in the past, we've had guys that were averaging 45 minutes, you know, a week of a of film. And, and so it's, uh, I think it's just based on your team and then based off also like, you know, what, um, what the kids, how the kids makeup is. Yeah. I'll tell you this quick story. It was kind of cool this week. Uh, Refraying back to Collier. So I get a, uh, I get an email, you know, a huddle email, Collier sent you a playlist. Well, most of the time that means it's Collier's place when he played here. But this time, so I click on it and we had our exhibition game last week. Collier's gone through and took and made nine clips and written detailed notes, teaching, coaching, you know, these younger guys up. So, you know, that's a little bit about our culture that our, our alumni are still involved, but that's awesome. You know, it, it was, I told her a couple of our guys, I, mean, I got guys that don't play here spending more time on film. But, <laughs> but Maybe he's know. angling for a job, man. Yeah, well, you know, but you guys know this too. Like I'm sitting here, right when we start talking, watching film for tomorrow, you know, tomorrow's game. And, you know, there's, there's a saying in, you know, in the South and maybe in the Midwest too, you know, the hay's in the barn. There's nothing else I'm going to find between right. 11 p.m. and, and <laughs> 1 a.m. It's like, oh, that's the piece I was looking for. Yeah. Yep. Like hey, got, but it makes you, makes you feel better, right? Yeah. It makes me feel better. And like I said, I'll have four pages of sky reports in my hand and I'll show the kids maybe half a page and feel like I've done my job and hope they can do theirs. No doubt. Well, I, I think you're, you're probably going to want to at some point get some sleep tonight. So I think we'll end the fourth quarter there. That's game, man. Thanks to you, Greg, for, jumping on with us and this is the fourth four quarter episode and i think each one gets a little bit better and the things that you're able to share are completely relevant for high school coaches out there so hopefully our audience is finding a tremendous amount of value in it i know we are 
And again, thanks for jumping out with us. And to everyone out there, we will catch you on our next episode. Thanks. Thanks for listening to the Hoop Heads Podcast, presented by Head Start Basketball.